Good morning. I'd like to call the meeting to order. My name is Jim Begley. I'm the chairperson of the Metropolitan Utilities District Board of Directors. I'd like to welcome you all to the committee meetings this morning. This meeting is being live streamed from the boardroom at MUD headquarters located at 7350 World Communications Drive. And recording of this meeting will be uploaded to the MUD website after the meeting's conclusion. I forgot to mention the date, August 7th, 2024. I'd like to invite Vice President of Safety and Security, Shane Hunter, to provide a briefing regarding protocol for all individuals in attendance at the board meeting today in the event of an emergency. Morning, Shane. Good morning, Shane Hunter, Vice President of Safety and Security. We are on the first floor here at MUD headquarters and a normal entry and exit from this room is the door that we entered at the rear of the space. There's also an alternate door and another exit here on the right-hand side of the room. And it's through that door and in that hallway that we'll find the nearest first aid kit and fire extinguisher. A little further down the hallway on the right-hand side is the AED. With the location of that AED in mind, show of hands who's CPR and AED trained in the room. Thank you very much. If there is a medical emergency in this room today and there's a need to call 911, they will be called from the security desk up at the front who will then escort EMS personnel into the space. If we need to leave this building for any reason today, we'll go through this door and take two lifts and end up in the parking garage for accountability. We don't expect severe weather today, but the severe weather shelter is also in that same hallway. That concludes the safety briefing. Thank you, Shane. Roll call, please. McGowan. Present via WebEx. Howard. Here. Kavanaugh. Here. Begley. Here. Cook. Here. Friend. Here. Sidzik. Here. I would like to advise all those in attendance that a copy of the Open Meetings Act is available on the wall in the back of the room. Item number one, we're moving up Judicial legislation, Legislative Committee. Uh, Government Relations Attorney Rick Kubat will now provide an update on the legislative special session. He'll be joining us via WebEx today. Good morning, Rick. Good morning. Is my audio okay? Yes. Yes. Uh, Good morning, uh, a brief update on the special session. Uh, I'm gonna start with uh, an easy one before we get into the uh, property tax proposal. Um, contained in an appropriations bill, LB3, uh, the legislature proposed to strike through language on the meter set assessment fee. You might recall that we negotiated an agreement with the state fire marshal's office last session allowing them to increase the meter set assessment cap from 20 cents to 50 cents. The proposed legislation in LB3 would strike that language and allow that meter set assessment to be determined at the discretion of the state fire marshal's office. Um, in, in working with the Nebraska League of Municipalities and other natural gas providers, a letter submitted to, was submitted to the Appropriations Committee uh, asking them to uh, get rid of that strike through language and maintain the current 50 uh, cent cap. Um, moving on to the bigger picture and the reason why the special session was called, which is the governor's property tax relief uh, proposal. Um, my understanding is that the governor's proposal LB1 is uh, pretty much uh, dead at this moment, unlikely to go anywhere. What the Revenue Committee is looking at doing is advancing LB9 uh, from Senator Janney Hughes. And what that bill does is it would have the state of Nebraska take over a much significant portion of aid to education and therefore lowering the property tax burden by the state, uh, essentially paying more for education. Uh, the way that they would fund it is they would get rid of numerous sales tax exemptions, uh, um, some additional excise taxes. And as it relates to uh, the district, this could make things a little bit more expensive on our procurement side of the business. Um, some items that are off the table that, that were not taxed that still will not be taxed are legal services and accounting services home and auto repair, advertising, cloud and da data services. Um, those items are not taxed currently. My understanding is the Revenue Committee uh, is not looking to tax those in the future with the new bill. 
Um, the items that they are looking to tax, one that could impact the district are items like lawn care, and we are still trying to get our hands wrapped around to what extent of any are, are they going to consider taxing business inputs or perhaps consulting services. Um, at this juncture, we don't have a hard copy of the, the uh, proposal. Um, within that LB9 of Senator Hughes, what the Revenue Committee is doing is they are taking bits and pieces of several pieces of proposed legislation to try and form what would be a compromised package that could perhaps get close to 33 votes. Um, where we are at at this juncture is we don't have a hard copy of that bill. Um, it'll be monitored and, and should the, there be items in there where it's necessary for the district to take a position, we will make sure that the board is well informed. The last item that I'll speak to that is, is supposedly going to be contained in that package, and there is a hearing on it this morning at 9 o'clock, is the exemption of, of specifically uh, residential electricity to exempt it from uh, from state sales tax. Uh, we're going to show up uh, today and testify in the neutral position and essentially state we support uh, anything in terms of removing regressive sales tax on utilities. That being said, we would be hopeful that the Revenue Committee would take a broader approach and consider uh, natural gas as part of that exemption are, are considered doing something where it could have a similar fiscal impact where they would give it both uh, residential electricity and residential natural gas similar tax treatment. Um, so I know I spit out a lot there, but that's kind of uh, everything going on in a nutshell and, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Hey Rick, um, back to procurement. Aren't uh, quasi-governmental entities such as MUD, uh, don't we enjoy uh, sales tax exemption for procurement, not, not on our bills? Um, we, we do on, we do on, on some things. Uh, I, I would say, you know, and I, I talked to Mr. Zellers about this yesterday. Um, if we buy a Kubota tractor from Kansas, um, we would pay city and state sales tax from uh, uh, from the, the location that that's delivered. So if it's delivered um, at the construction center, we're going to pay the state of Nebraska, uh, as I understand it, 5.5% uh, state sales tax and 1.5% uh, sales tax to the city of Omaha. Okay. So on the, on the procurement side, I would say no. It's a little bit more complex than that. Um, we do have some narrow sales tax exemptions uh, for stuff that we use in processing and, and refining, like our chlorine and lime would be subject to sales tax. Uh, but when we go out and buy uh, cement, mains, and material, those items would be subject to sales tax. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Rick. Appreciate it. Good luck. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Senior Vice President and Chief Operations Officer Kendall Miner will now review the proposed capital expenditures. Good morning, Kendall. Good morning. Um, before I get into the CapEx letter today, I would like to recognize and highlight um, our operations team, you know, from the storm last Wednesday, they did a really good job of making sure that our water production was, you know, where it needed to be, all of our tests and all our water quality. Um, from a constructability standpoint, uh, construction, we had about 14 water main breaks that they responded to beautifully. Uh, a lot of the, the gas infrastructure, uh, we had some, you know, some concerns and things with that, but our team responded well during the, during the midst of the storm. So. Definitely want to highlight the operations team for doing a great job doing that in the midst of the storm. So, Kendall, this is Mike McGowan. <clears throat> did we have any gas mains or gas ruptures during the storm? I know we had water, but do we have any gas ruptures? We didn't have any gas ruptures uh, that were reported to, to our knowledge, but we did have some structures that had some gas leaks and things like that. The gas D and our team responded to to mitigate to make sure that we didn't have any issues. So. Okay. I, I, I've heard a lot of good reports from people around town that I've been at the grocery store or other things saying MUD was so responsive and very good about it. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. 
All right, Jay, you'll pull up the, per the first picture for us, please. Going into the uh, CapEx letter for the for this board meeting, I uh, wanted to go back and revisit the OPPD, OPPD North Omaha power plant gas meter set design. Um, and as I mentioned in the letter to the board that was, or the memo to the board that was sent out uh, a little bit earlier, doing a deeper dive into this, uh, this picture just shows the existing runs of the six um, gas meters that are going into uh, that facility. And this is going to be uh, replaced with the two um, pipe runs. Jay, if you'll go to the next picture, please. If you'll zoom in on that picture for us, please. Where you see the white piping right there, in the middle of that white piping is the ultrasonic design or the ultrasonic gas meter set. Um, and again, a little bit deeper dive and more research into this. Uh, this is going to provide uh, about 5,000 decatherms of gas flow uh, into this facility, which is equivalent to about 2,500 Walmarts, um, just for a scale. Of, and then the frequency in which we get this meter set design actually requested from us is very infrequent. It's only a five to 10 year um, request. So it's not really uh, offered or you know requested that often. So I just wanted to provide that additional insight uh, to the board and still are bringing this forward for recommendation for uh, moving forward with the CHI doing this design. Any questions, additional questions or concerns? Um, the other two items that I would like to, to discuss this morning on the system improvements is um, item number one on the system improvements ratification. This project has already been done at North 72nd Street and Mercy Road. It is uh, $280,000, excuse me. Um, and this is abandoning a 16 inch and two 6 inch water main valves, as well as uh, hydro. A hydrant being relocated. Um, this work has already been completed. Uh, historically, this was something that uh, we've had about 18, I think it was buried 18 feet, but just over the years of time of repaving asphalt, concrete, everything for that road, uh, I, this is definitely a project that had a lot of attention, has definitely caused a lot of traffic. Uh, interruptions and things like that, but like you know, I'm, I'm happy to say that we're done with this from a constructability standpoint now, and you know now this has been relocated, is the, and this area is back open now on 72nd. So happy to report that. Uh, that was the first item. The next item on the streetcar, Farm Street, and uh, from South 18th Street to South 28th Street is $616,000, or excuse me, $616, yeah, thousand dollars. Uh, relocating gas mains. This is the fifth of eight gas main relocations for this for the streetcar project. Uh, this work is began in September of 2024 uh, and to be constructed by our crews. Um, this is within the 7.6 million dollar limit agreed upon uh, with the city in Omaha, of uh, the city of Omaha and, and MUD. Uh, and this segment of work is uh, gas work is reimbursable. And I would, you know, like to add to that is, you know, approximately we spent $2.6 million in aggregate on the streetcar project to date. So. Kendall, a question on uh, who is going to reimburse. Is it the city of Omaha that's going to reimburse us for this particular $615,000 project? Yes. It would be the city of Omaha. And they know that. And they've yes, agreed to that. <laughs> okay. I just, I just want to make sure. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Good questions, Director Friend. It's it's been quiet, so I ask that question a lot because mm -hmm. yes, we've uh, had that agreement and we've talked it over in person several times. So we're going to try to keep the board posted to the level you want to be posted. But this highlights uh, on the gas side just how much work dropped on us because of this uh, streetcar project. Seven, seven projects, and they're big projects. So uh, the other side, the water is just, it's beginning, and it's not going to end anytime soon. So we feel like we're in a good place with this. OK, so 7.6 million minus 2.6 million they get five more million dollars worth of work. That's correct. All right, everybody. I, I, that's the kind of arithmetic I'm <laughs> good at. And 
just to clarify, in that five million, does that include reimbursable amounts from them, or this is still like we're not going to have to do any other turn the envelope over and do any more arithmetic in, in terms of more money that is seems like it could cost us something, but really is reimbursable. All right. And to answer that question directly, yes, you're correct. The gas main relocation work will be the reimbursable dollars that we would get from the city. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. So five more million dollars, that's it. So, uh, Mr. Miner, Mr. Doyle, I just want to make sure the easy way I was able to understand this was we agreed to up to $7.6 million mm -hmm. if it was part of an infrastructure replacement that we were going to do anyway, we may have moved the calendar on when we did that infrastructure replacement if it happened to be in where the streetcar is going to run. So those things we were going to do anyway, this is an example of something we were not going to do, therefore it is reimbursable. That's how I understood it. And that made it easy for me to understand, okay, there are certain things we were going to do anyway. If that is part of the streetcar and we can move it up 12 months or whatever we need to do, we were going to do it anyway. Yes, that's right. It was, uh, <clears throat> Director Friend, that is more clear on the gas side because that a lot of that infrastructure, like through Midtown Crossing, is fairly new. Yeah. Waterside was a little bit not as clear, and with the board, we agreed to say, well, we normally go out X amount of years. We'll go a little farther than usual, but we don't want to impact other projects way outside of this area that were already in place due to our model. So yeah, yes, that's we were going to do it anyway. Okay, thank you. Interim Director of Plant Engineering, Adam Gartner will review the change order number one, cast iron water main replacement. Good morning, Adam. Good morning. Uh, I actually have the next agenda item, tab six, to the acceptance of contracts and payment of final estimates. Okay. Sorry, right. Adam. Go, go ahead and proceed. I'm back. Okay. So, uh, total of three projects on this month's finals letter. Um, all of them are typical water development projects. Uh, I was just planning to highlight item C. This project was to install water mains in the new subdivision of Westbrook Hills. Westbrook Hills is located uh, north 138th Street and Ida Street. Valley Corporation completed this project. Uh, Valley Corporation is a relatively new contractor uh, to the district. They have been completing uh, projects in kind of the recent time frame since about 2019. Uh, Valley is also beginning a new water infrastructure replacement project that was competitively bid just a few months. So I just want to take a quick second to highlight the everyone's efforts across the district to expand the district's pool of contractors. Thank you. Thank you. Vice President of Procurement and Enterprise Services, John Zellers, will now review the bids on materials and contracts. Good morning, John. Good morning. John Zellers, Vice President, Procurement and Enterprise Services. Bids on materials and contracts may be found under tab seven. And there are just a few items that I plan to discuss, and the first may be found at the top of page two. We are recommending the rejection of the single bid from Hawkins Construction for work at the Platte West Water Treatment Plant as it exceeds budget. The project consists of primarily two scopes of work, significant painting of piping in the well field and within the plant, and underground pipe work in the well field. Engineering is looking at separating the scopes into two separate projects to rebid in an effort to attract task-specific contractors and more favorable bids. Further down the page, we are recommending hey, the- John, Excuse me, John. John, yes. Mike, Mike McGowan, on that project, I was wondering, it's for com regulatory compliance. And if we reject the bid and we delay it, what about the compliance? So what, what do we have to comply by, for and by when? So the regulatory compliance portion of this is associated with the three-year inspection, uh, sanitary inspection that is conducted by the Nebraska Department of uh, Environment and Energy. Uh, with that, uh, they found uh, some areas uh, regarding painting uh, in the well field. Uh, and some in the plant. This particular project also includes uh, additional painting, actually significant painting within the plant as well that uh, 
that we want to perform as our continual maintenance of that, that facility. We have until 2025 to make those corrections so um, that uh, NDE E had identified and uh, we feel that uh, we can still meet those by uh, going this, this way. Okay, okay thank, thank you, you. that answers, answers my question. question. All right, you're welcome. All right, further down the page, we're recommending the second low bid for V-blade snow plows that will be installed on pickup trucks that we recently purchased as a low bidder did not meet the specifications. The next item is at the top of page three. We are recommending a contract extension with BK Corrosion for the following year's purchase of anodes. BK Corrosion has agreed to hold last year's pricing and terms. The last item I'd like to discuss are the annual quick line bids shown on pages four and five. As the board may be aware, upon receiving bids, we require bidders to provide a sample of their lime. During the bid evaluation that's conducted by our water quality division, tests, uh, tests are conducted to determine the available calcium oxide of the samples, and then they calculate the bid value of each bidder's submittal. The first value that is shown in the bid letter is the actual bid based on the estimated quantity and the bidder's price per ton. The second is the value of the bid based on the percentage of available calcium oxide per ton of product. This is the value that is based on the quality of the product. Bids are evaluated based on the quality of lime, therefore the higher quality of lime results in a lower bid value as less product is, uh, is required to achieve the desired treatment levels that we seek. And that's all I plan to discuss, but would be happy to answer any questions. John, this is kind of, who does the testing? It just piqued my interest when you said uh, testing on the calcium oxide. So uh, Florence does within our okay, quality. So our own people. Test our own people, yes. Yeah. Yep, they submit. They submit. Uh, the vendors submit, and we test. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, thank you. Thanks, John. Senior Vice President and General Counsel Mark Mendenhall will now present the City of Ralston Franchise and Acquisition Agreement. Morning, Mark. All right, good morning. Uh, Mark Mendenhall, General Counsel, Senior Vice President, General Counsel. Uh, behind tab nine, you will see the recommendation for the renewal of the water franchise and acquisition agreement with the City of Ralston. I'm sure you will all remember the conversation that we had in February as I presented the recommendation at that time. We had a proposed agreement with the City of Ralston, kind of twofold, if you recall. One would be a renewal of the 25-year franchise to provide water services within the City of Ralston. Really, I'd, I'd say what that does is that provides the district the rights to utilize the city's rights of way to lay, maintain, operate the, the, the system. Uh, Ralston is this, uh, has been a unique uh, franchise that we've held in that the city has always owned their system. So all the mains, the valves, the hydrants, et cetera. Uh, we've just operated them. Uh, over the course of the subsequent renewals, the parties have discussed the district taking over ownership, which has been our preference. Um, those conversations led to the February proposal. Uh, as we looked at it, our recommendation was that we would uh, then collect a fee from Ralston's customers to eventually, over a course of 10 years, replace about 0.7 mile of what we've determined to be shallow mains, mains having less than three foot of cover. After I presented to you all in February, uh, the city of Ralston, Ralston City Council, the mayor, city manager, they had more questions uh, about essentially the risk associated with that, those shallow mains and the, and the dollars to be collected to, to replace those mains. That caused our team to have further discussions internally and then discussions externally with, uh, with the Ralston team. And where we have landed now is uh, the recommendation before you all, which is a renewal of the 25-year franchise agreement, and then an acquisition uh, that would not include collection of the $899,000 over the course of 10 years. And the reason that we've taken that off is, I'd say, primarily threefold. Uh, one, we have determined that those mains, that 0.7 mile of main, just because it's shallow does not create any greater risk 
when compared to the rest of the system. Part, part, I mean, when, you, when you think about it, we've gone through a number of uh, freezes. Uh, the, the polar vortex is, is a good example. Those mains have operated, uh, albeit they are not at our construction standard, but they have operated. Um, we do not have any break history on those shallow mains to suggest that they should be within the five, let alone 10 year replacement plan, and, and they, they are not. And so when we uh, look at it that way, we agreed that um, that would not be an appropriate co uh, additional fee to put on the, the, the people of Ralston. Number two, I would say we have uh, since we've been operating the system, uh, essentially since 1972, we've been collecting the WER fees since we've uh, implemented the WER, and from 2020 through present, we've collected and not spent approximately $500,000 in WER funds from residents of the city of Ralston. So we have those dollars set aside. We currently have a planned IR project for 2025 uh, that we would designate those for, but in the event, uh, I guess it, it, in the interim, we are still collecting word that we could address the shallow mains if they do cause cause an issue. Um, and so I'd say, and then and then finally, we um, put back in a provision to the agreement that requires the city uh, to reimburse. Speaking of reimbursement, to reimburse the district for relocation costs that are uh, as a result of a street uh, or public works project. So, as Ralston looks to redevelop certain sections of their town and they have a planned project right now that they've been looking at on 72nd Street south of Main Street. If you can put yourself there, there's more of a large industrial area. Uh, they store semi-trailers and I believe uh, there's a window dis distribution company. There's a number of more industrial usage. The city wants to redevelop that into commercial uh, light residential, more of a um, kind of a business district, that would most likely require relocation of mains. Then that would be a cost that the city would pay, and 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 not the district. And so, for those reasons, we felt it appropriate to remove uh, the collection of that fee. Um, and the resulting agreement had been presented to the city of Ralston City Council. They approved at their uh, August. No, I'm sorry, July 16th meeting, I believe it was. Uh, and it is being uh, recommended to you all for approval now. Upon your approval, Mr. Doyle would execute and the Ralston agreement would be renewed. Any happy to answer any questions you may have. Mark, this might, <clears throat> on that, uh, I understand we took the fee out for relocating those because of shallowness. What if, what if there, by chance one does rupture? You say they haven't had any ruptures, but. What if they did have one rupture? Are we responsible then for the cost to repair it, or would they be? Mark, can I uh, can I take that one sure. first, and then uh, Director McGowan? This is Mark Doyle. Interesting question, and we talked about this uh, pretty thoroughly. And I met with the team and the mayor of Ralston and their a couple of their council members and staff. Uh, the, this franchise is quite different than any other franchise I've been involved with, and I know I haven't been involved with that many, but I came on the board shortly after uh, then-director Bill Cavanaugh turned the valve to open up Bellevue to MUD, and that was somewhere around 1989. That was a franchise in the classic sense where MUD acquired a municipal water system that had their own employees, their own wells, their own distribution system. We rate financed it over 25 years, and the reason that happened is because Bellevue had to pay us to become part of our system for deficiencies, and we caught most of them, but their main, their two-inch mains weren't considered mains in our world, for example. So. No were, no service, it, it was a rate financed acquisition and after 25 years, that went away. Accurate? Yeah, fair. Ralston came about in the early 70s and we're only speculating now. If Jack Frost were here, I'd ask him, but that's a joke. <laughs> we're only speculating, but we think uh, MUD took Ralston, 
I guess there's paperwork, but almost on an agreement that we're going to treat this system. They had one or two water towers in Ralston, and they didn't have the same affinity toward them that Miller does. So they're not there anymore that I know of. We took that system, and it became ours. We do everything. We re we've read meters. We've I don't know if the system was metered before that or not, but it is. And I'm thinking it was because they didn't want to have the Omaha identity and remain Ralston, and you know the history of that. That's never gone away. This is a unicorn in terms of uh, franchises. Back to your question, Director McGowan, if Ralston decided not to go along and we waited a couple years, this would be no different than it is today. We respond and we pay for water main breaks in Ralston currently. That's really different. But in Bellevue, we didn't, you know, that was a different thing. We covered that in the rate financed agreement that each customer paid over 25 years. We had to do some speculating. So the, I think the answer is yes, we would, but even if we didn't ink this agreement and it officially becomes ours and Ralston's out of the mix, we would pay for it also. That's correct, yeah. Uh, the I mean, cost nothing for, really changes here. The cost for those repairs would just be absorbed yeah. and, um, and then utilized for future budgeting purposes to ensure that we're collecting an appropriate amount from all of the ratepayers across the entire system. And Ralston votes for directors at elections. They are in Director McGowan's. That well. hasn't always been the case. We changed that back when we annexed all areas that were in our service territory to make sure that they did have a voice and they were able to vote. So these have been good customers and what also makes them different, they've been paying a WER fee, which means they're investing in the entire system. We've had projects in, in Ralston, not that many infrastructure replacement projects because the system is in pretty good shape. And after one that's scheduled in the next year or two, its risk ranking as a as a, a area which we don't normally do is better than than a lot of the rest of the system. So, long answer to that, but I think it's important to discuss. We're not giving anything away here. We just think we need to get Ralston out of the discussion. And this became a little bit difficult when they developed the Lakeview Golf Course area. Then they were saying, "Hey, wait a minute." Why are these costs on us when this is, even though it's not your system, we've been paying WER money, there should be, I can't tell you all the details, but it causes confusion and nothing really changes. And these are great customers. We gain revenue. We gain more revenue off of the commercial industrial than we do off the residential. But we have, we, 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 make, we make money on Ralston. We're not here to make money. That's reinvested into the system. But it's really an anomaly or a unicorn, and this will really clean things up nicely. These yep. are great customers. Fair, a little bit more detail, but this is a good MUD history item, so. No, I appreciate that, and I, I would hope that when this agreement comes up 25 years down the road, that somehow, in all seriousness. It won't come up anymore. It will not come up. We just. We just absorb it. Well, we'll renew the franchise okay. every 25 years, but okay. the acquisition piece, no, it won't come that, up anymore for me. That, right, but, uh, but, but I, in, in all sincerity, well, I, that's what I meant to say. <laughs> I, I do hope that the history that you just uh, spoke to so eloquently and uh, articulately, that that gets captured within our record somehow, because the further we get away from 1972, the, the more difficult it will be to try to understand why we've made decisions uh, going back and up to today, why we have. So I appreciate that uh, well, little hope, history lesson today. I hope it's accurate. Yep. No, that's something <laughs> that's what near I recall. and dear to my heart, uh, Chair Begley, uh, ensuring that our records appropriately and accurately reflect the decisions that we've made. Because I've looked back uh, on a number of things, and you know, you're 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 going through old paper that seems to be falling apart at your fingertips, and you find something that's like, oh, that's why we made this decision. So very important to track why we're doing things. So great, great point. An institutional knowledge that uh, our dearly departed uh, former colleague Jack Frost did have. Um, we appreciated that, and um, it'll be good to have that on, on paper and uh, for uh, reference going forward. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Jack wasn't on the board. So His dad was, though. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, Jack wasn't on the board. That part's true. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's right. Vice President of Engineering Masania will now review the proposed main extensions. Good morning, Masa. Good morning. Masania, Vice President of Engineering. The main extensions letter is behind uh, tab 10. Uh, this month, we have three water main extensions. The impact of these water main extensions include water service and fire protection to 131 residential lots, seven commercial lots, and seven out lots. The first two projects are fairly standard, uh, listed on the page WP2117 and WP2110. Uh, there are no district costs involved with these. I'd also like to point out that we are uh, collecting uh, Pioneer main fees uh, for around $125,000 to oversize mains to these two developments. I'd like to highlight the, uh, the last main extension project on the page, uh, number three, WP2121. Uh, Jay's showing a map of uh, this project area here. Uh, this main extension is being done in accordance with our infill main policy. Uh, lot two, which is located north of Alberta Avenue and west of 9th Street in Bellevue, has requested water service for a new building. Uh, there's no water main in Alberta Avenue fronting lot two for this building to tap. Uh, however, a water main uh, for installation uh, as the lot to the south of Alberta Avenue uh, developed back in 1999 was, uh, was requested or uh, planned. Uh, so at that time, uh, the development to the south of Alberta uh, paid for a future water main to be installed based on their, their frontage. Uh, that, those dollars were collected back in 1999 and it's listed in the letter as $23,357. Uh, the district did not install the water main in Alberta Avenue at that time due to risk of relocation as the road was not yet built. And the next slide shows uh, a Sarpy County aerial photograph uh, not long after the 1999 request uh, showing Alberta Avenue without the road being there. So um, infill mains uh, like this, uh, we, we want to hold off on uh, putting those in uh, when there's no really real benefit to the system, but we, we do collect uh, funds on that. Uh, so the developer is, for lot two to the north, is, is paying for their frontage. The district's cost is primarily uh, due to inflationary increases uh, from 1999, uh, covering the southern uh, portion of the main installation. Uh, these infill mains aren't very frequent. We, we have uh, fairly uh, good records of orderly growth in our system, but they do come up once in a while. Uh, the last time an infill main uh, was presented to the board was March of 2020 for Project WP 1741. Uh, finally, I'd like to mention that this water main will be installed by district crews. And that's all I'd like to highlight on this, uh, this month's letter. Would be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Monson. All right, thank you. Vice President of Human Resources, Bonnie Savine, will now review employee wage and or salary increases and ratifications. Good morning, Bonnie. Good morning. Bonnie Savine, Vice President, Human Resources. I'll begin by recapping counts of employees July 31st, 2023 and 24. On July 31st, 2023, there were 882 regular full-time employees and four regular part-time employees for a total of 886. And a first for me to say this July, we had 901 regular full-time employees and four regular part-time employees for a total of 905 regular employees. We also had 15 interns, one temporary part-time employee, and 18 summer hires. So um, a very big number for us to share this month. A review of jobs actively in various stages of the job placement process. We have five requisitions for new positions that are routing through the job description review and approval process. We have two jobs that are currently posted. One is external and the other is both internal and external. We have seven jobs that have applications being reviewed or going through interviews. And we also have four jobs that each have a selected candidate. So four new employees that will be onboarding in the next few weeks. <coughs> 
One other item that I wanted to highlight uh, this month, we had two blood drives last month. I know Director Kavanaugh, you have inquired about the district blood drives in the past and we did hold two on the 9th and the 11th where 56 employees donated 58 units of blood. 45 of those were new donors to the Nebraska Community Blood Bank and we chose Nebraska Community Blood Bank because they keep all of the donations local. And now behind tab 11, you will find the wage and or salary increases and ratifications letter. Human Resources is recommending the Board of Directors approve wage or salary increases for seven employees this month. We have five OAC employees that are being promoted due to a posted normal job posting. We have two SPA employees that are being promoted as well and we have two SPA new hire ratifications. Questions? I have a question. Sure. Um, I think I asked this when I first started, because uh, it's come up in some conversations. Do, how do we determine whether or not we will have only an internal pool of candidates, particularly for people who might be interested in moving up into a spa position? from an hourly one. Is, is there a rubric? And then I have a follow-up question. Sure. For, well, for... How do you decide Specifically for SPA positions. Correct. The supervisory group is asked if they have an interest in posting internally and externally. Typically, we suggest both. We think that it's a an opportunity for employees as well as our external candidates to compete and demonstrate their competencies and skills and experience for the job. Um, and unless there is a specific interest in only posting internally, we do most often post both internally and externally okay. for those. All right, I don't know, I was, had the idea that people, that we were encouraging people to stay and move up Absolutely. and that might be one way, but from your experience, it's always posted internally and externally based on the um, area, the, based on the supervisory group and what they're looking for in terms of uh, a pool. Yes, that's the default option and mm -hmm. then the supervisor and their chain of management can make a recommendation if they think it makes sense to only go internally. Um, we have those conversations and why, but that is the, the more typical uh, approach. Okay, and my follow-up question is in terms of the job descriptions, requirements, nice to have, needs to have, how mm -hmm. often are those uh, job descriptions reviewed, is that something that would happen at the time that the supervisory group comes to you, it's like, hey, we, this is open, and wow, wouldn't it be great to also have this skill level? Is it rewritten every time, or is it, do they start putting it together when they realize someone's going to leave? And again, I'm thinking particularly of a person who might want to move into a spot position. Absolutely, we do have a, very specific standard process when a job requisition is submitted uh, to through the system. Our compensation team kicks off uh, a link to the job description. We have a program that manages the job descriptions. So that allows the supervisor to go in and review the job description. We expect the supervisors to do that with any job vacancy. It's an opportunity to take a fresh look at the job description. We update standardized language. Sometimes we make changes where we standardize certain, um, certain items on the job description. So even if there are no material changes by the supervisors, it is still re-signed and that way it has a nice um, fresh review by both the human resources department as well as the supervisory team. And so they wouldn't, you don't just say, okay, every so often you look at the job description, there's nobody that's just doing that on an ongoing basis. It's done when the opportunity presents itself it for is the supervisory group. Correct. It's always done when the job, when a job is vacant. We do periodically review them within the period between job vacancies, but that's um, 
having a, a regimented plan for that is something we are working to do. Uh, the other one-offs are usually because there has been a change. There's been a system change or a job duty change, something that has shifted that's prompted the review of the job description between vacancies. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, hey Bonnie, to follow up on uh, Director Cook's question, may I request that um, anytime there's a change to a job description, that those be presented to the personnel committee? Because sometimes they are minimal changes. Sometimes they are, they are uh, big changes to the job description, which requires another degree or, or a certification is added or a certification has become a preference on the job description. Just so we're aware of of any kind of change before a job gets posted, um, just to ensure that um, we're aware of, of any changes that might be taking place. I will work with you on Thank that. you, thank you. You're welcome. It is part of the process that you that you had mentioned um, in reviewing those job descriptions. Sure. Thank you. And Bonnie, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, wage reopeners can be examined at the request of the union or employees or management. And when that happens, then it's an automatic review of the job description, is that correct? That is correct. That is actually just closed for this year and we'll be undertaking uh, about 19 meetings on wager openers and that, that does bring the job description into conversation. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Bonnie, I have a, yes. I have a question that year is quickly getting away from us. Who could believe this is already we're in August. Uh, can you give us any update on the uh, health fair that you always have in October, which is uh, such a good event? Yes, absolutely. That event is going to be this October. I believe it's Tuesday the 29th. And so we will be, or Wednesday the 30th, but it will be literally right before Halloween. And we're looking forward to that. And we will have uh, um, all of the vendors, uh, benefit administrators back, including our mammogram bus, um, the boot barn. We'll have our um, um, vaccine clinic again through Cole's Pharmacy. So that includes shingles, pneumonia, and flu vaccines, as well as COVID vaccines. And then we will have a total wellness there again, doing biometric screenings for uh, employees, retirees, their family members, those that are covered under our insurance, if they want to participate in that, we have that available to provide lipid, um, cholesterol, uh, triglycerides, and blood sugar. So a little opportunity for folks to, to have some awareness of not only their benefits, as well as their health. Thank you, that's always such a great event and you get such a good turnout, which is, do. is wonderful. I'm gonna put that on the calendar. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, Bonnie. Are there any members of the public in attendance today who would like to address the board? Seeing none, do any board members have any further comments? Seeing none, uh, before we adjourn, I'm just gonna read a brief statement. On behalf of my fellow MED board members, management and employees, I would like to recognize the critically important work being done by OPPD and their mutual aid crews to restore power to thousands of customers this past week after the historic outage. I'd like to give special recognition to IBW 763 and the line crews, President Dave Benock and Vice President Jason Cavanaugh and their workers have done incredible work under terrible circumstances. As of yesterday, OPPD had 1,500 people working on restoration efforts, including a record number of mutual aid crews from utilities and contractors across Nebraska and the region. As a fellow public utility, we salute the hard work and sacrifice by these crews to work through challenging conditions and extremely high temperatures to bring the lights back on safely and efficient, as efficiently as possible. Additionally, we sincerely appreciate the opportunity for MUD staff to visit the OPPD staging area and observe the response. The valuable insights and hospitality MUD employees received during the visit were immensely beneficial. OPPD's support in accommodating our team was crucial and deepened our understanding of the complexities involved in their response efforts. The opportunity highlights the partnership between our organizations. 
thank you very much. And special thank you to board member Gwen Howard for suggesting to recognize our colleagues at OPPD. With that, seeing no further comments from anybody from the public or the board, we stand adjourned for 10 minutes. We will readjourn at 9.15. Good job, Jim. Good job.
I'd like to call the meeting to order. My name is Jim Begley. I'm the chairperson of the Metropolitan Utilities District Board of Directors. I'd like to welcome you all to the regular monthly board meeting this morning, August 7th, 2024. This meeting is being live streamed from the boardroom at the MED headquarters building located at 7350 World Communications Drive and a recording of this meeting will be uploaded to the MED website after the meeting's conclusion. Roll call, please. McGowan. Present via WebEx. Howard. Here. Kavanaugh. Here. Begley. Here. Cook. Here. Friend. Here. Sidzik. Here. I would like to advise all those in attendance that a copy of the Open Meetings Act is available on the wall in the back of the room. And now for those who wish to participate, we, we will recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Approval of minutes for the committee meetings and a regular board meeting for July 3rd, 2024. Do we have a motion? I so move. Second. Discussion? Roll call. McGowan. Yes. yes. Howard? Yes. Kavanaugh? Yes. Begley? Yes. Cook? Yes. Friend? Yes. Sidzik? Yes. Director Friend? Thank you. Thank you. Item number five, capital expenditures. This was discussed in committee. I move approval as outlined in the memo from Kendall Minor, dated August 1st. Second. Discussion? Roll call. McGowan? Yes. Howard? Yes. Kavanaugh? Yes. Begley? Yes. Cook? Yes. Friend? Yes. Sidzik? Yes. Item number six, acceptance of contracts and payment of final estimates, also discussed in committee. I move approval as outlined in the memo from Adam Gartner, dated July 17th. Second. Discussion? Roll call. McGowan? Yes. yes. Howard? Yes. Kavanaugh? Yes. Begley? Yes. Cook? Yes. Friend? Yes. Sidzik? Yes. Item number seven, bids on materials and contracts for the month of July, also discussed in committee. I move approval as outlined in the memo from <laughs> Sherry Lightfoot, dated July 24th. Second. Discussion? Roll call. McGowan? Yes. yes. Howard? Yes. Kavanaugh? Yes. Begley? Yes. Cook? Yes. Friend? Yes. Sidzik? Yes. Item number eight, notice of purchases between twenty-five and 50000 be placed on file. Item number nine, renewal of water franchise agreement with the city of Ralston. I move approval for the president to enter into this agreement as outlined in the memo from Mark Mendenhall dated July 31st. Second. Discussion. Roll call. McGowan. <coughs> yes. Howard. Yes. Kavanaugh. Yes. Begley? Yes. Cook? Yes. Friend? Yes. Sitzik? Yes. Item number 10, main extensions discussed in committee. I move approval as outlined in the memo from Masania dated July 30th. Second. Discussion? Roll call. McGowan? Yes. yes. Howard? Yes. Kavanaugh? Yes. Begley? Yes. Cook? Yes. Friend? Yes. Sitzik? Yes. Item number 11, wage and or salary increases and ratifications. I move for approval of wage and or salary increases and ratifications as discussed in committee this morning and outlined in Ms. Savine's memo dated July 26, 2024. Second. Discussion. Roll call. McGowan? Yes. yes. Howard? Yes. Kavanaugh? Yes. Begley? Yes. Cook? Yes. Friend? Yes. Sidzik? Yes. Do board members have anything they wish to discuss further? I'm gonna bring one item up for consideration as we go into the fall. Um, I've always found it kind of interesting that during an election year, um, the MUD board may be the only governing body that convenes the day after an election. So um, I'm gonna put it out for consideration to the board 
if we'd like to keep our meeting for the day after the general election, that'd be Wednesday, November 7th. I'm, is that? Yeah. Yes. Whatever Wednesday that is. Um, or if we want to move it up to the Monday before or move it to Thursday or keep it on Wednesday. Because either way, it'll be a political earthquake that we'll all be uh, processing. Yes. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out for consideration. Um, we can talk about it next month in more detail as you give it more thought, so. Thank you. And I also want to uh, thank Mark Myers for a very comprehensive uh, response to my question about possible a probable impacts on our revenue from Kellogg's closing. So thank you, you answered several things and I'm glad you're on top of it. And uh, <coughs> thank you for a quick one. I didn't expect it that fast, it was last night. So thanks, Mark. Are any members of the public present who wish to comment about anything? Seeing none, we have no closed session today. Do we have a motion to adjourn? I so move. moved. Second. Discussion? Roll call. McGowan? Yes. Howard? Yes. Kavanaugh? Yes. Begley? Yes. Cook? Yes. Friend? Yes. Siddick? Yes. Meeting adjourned 921.